Hi, my name is Felix Matos Rodriguez and I am the Chancellor of the City University of New York. People who know me call me Fellow and this is my new conversation space on CUNY TV, Café con Fellow. Bienvenidos a Café con Fellow. My guest today is one of science's greatest thinkers, a brilliant theorist that Science Magazine named as one of the top 10 most influential scientists in the world today. He's our own City College of New York and graduate Senate professor, Michio Kaku. For 50 years, Professor Kaku has engaged prospective CUNY scientists through his own love of theoretical physics and his groundbreaking work on string theory. His charismatic ability to explain complex scientific theories and make them widely understood has made him one of the most widely known figures in science in the world. The professor is also well known for his social activism and his important work on issues from global warming to nuclear disarmament and what he believes can be the misuse of science. He's a prolific writer who has written five New York Times bestsellers, the most recent one being The God Equation, the quest for a theory of everything. Welcome, Professor Kaku. And the first and most important question, do you drink coffee and how do you take it? That's a tough one. I'll have to think about that one. Yes, I drink coffee. A little bit of sugar, a little bit of cream would be perfectly fine. Difficult question. We're delighted to have you here with us. And uh, I think it'd be good for our audience to get a sense as to how you ended up being in the faculty at uh, City College of New York, uh, which you started about some 50 years ago, right? That's right. Well, it all started during World War II. There was a lot of anti-Japanese hysteria at that time. And my parents were US citizens, but they got swept up, placed be behind barbed wire, machine guns, stripped of all their assets, were confiscated, and that's where my older brother was born. And so when the camps opened up and I grew up as a kid, I began to realize I have to give back, give back to society, help those who are in a position like I was back then where all your rights, your assets, your money was confiscated by the government to make sure it doesn't happen again. Well, that was a, such a dark chapter in the history of this, of this country, and uh, it, is, it is so good that you sort of bring it to the people's attention. So how does that history from those camps leads to your passion for science, uh, your own education, and then uh, coming to be a faculty member at City College? Well, it all started when I was eight years old. <laughs> when I was eight years old, something happened which changed my life completely. The newspapers just announced that a great scientist had just died. And they put a picture, a famous picture of his desk on the news. And the caption said, this desk contains the picture of a book that he could not finish. And I said to myself, what could be so hard that a great scientist could not finish this book? I was fascinated, mesmerized. I had to know what was so difficult he couldn't finish a simple book. I went to the library. I found out this man's name was Albert Einstein. And this book was to be the theory of everything. An equation perhaps no more than one inch long that would allow us to quote, read the mind of God. Well, I was hooked. <laughs> I had to know everything. Who was this man, Albert Einstein? What is this unified field theory? So when I was in high school, I decided to be part of this great tradition and I built an atom smasher, a particle accelerator in my mom's garage. I said to myself, I said to my mom, Mom, can I have permission to build an atom smasher in the garage? And she said, sure. And don't forget to take out the garbage. <laughs> well, I took out the garbage. I assembled uh, 300 pounds of transformer steel, 22 miles of copper wire, and I built a six kilowatt, 2.3 million electron volt beta tron accelerator in my mom's garage. <laughs> Every time I plugged it in, I heard this crackling sound as six kilowatts of power surged through my machine. And then there was this pop, 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 pop sound as I blew out every circuit breaker in the house. And my poor mom, she must have said, why couldn't I have a son who plays basketball? Or why can't he find a nice Japanese girlfriend? Why does he have to build these machines in the garage? Well, because of that, I went to Harvard 
then Berkeley for my PhD, and then I was at Princeton University working on this fantastic theory called string theory. It's a theory that bowled over all the previous ideas of physics. The ultimate unit of the universe is a string. And when it vibrates, it creates subatomic particles. Each subatomic particle is a note. This is an electron. This is a proton. This is a quark. We're talking about music, the music of subatomic particles. I said to myself, wow, this could be it. This could be the theory of everything. So what are the subatomic particles, the quarks and the mesons and the neutrons and protons? They're nothing but musical notes on a tiny vibrating string. What is physics? Physics is the harmonies you can make on these vibrating strings. What is chemistry? Chemistry is the uh, vibrations that collide to create chemical reactions. What is the universe? The universe is a symphony of strings. And then what is the mind of God? The mind of God would be cosmic music resonating through hyperspace. That, we think, is the mind of God. So, and where did this theory come from? In part, City College. A lot of the basic papers written by myself and my colleagues at City College. So that's where part of string theory was born. Well, what a great, great journey. And uh, I want to go back to that connection you have with Albert Einstein, right? You sort of told the story about that eight-year-old boy that gets fascinated by, by the picture and the, and the unfinished book and the, uh, the question he couldn't quite totally answer, right? But you have kept a connection with Albert Einstein through your writing, through your career. Can you talk a bit more about that uh, uh, figure of both inspiration and, I guess, sparring, I guess, intellectually at some level, too? Well, now we can go beyond Einstein. Einstein, of course, paved the way for this unified field theory. But now we think that string theory could, we're not sure, could be the missing link, the link that defied Einstein. And we're building machines to test this theory. The biggest machine of science is the Large Hadron Collider, a $14 billion machine in Geneva, Switzerland, which is creating particles that are slammed together. And we look at these particles and we catalog them. And we think that they correspond to musical notes. A, B flat, C sharp, so on and so forth. How many musical notes are there? An infinite number. How many subatomic particles are there? Probably an infinite number. And so at City College, some of us are able to actually investigate some of the workings of, of the string theory. And my contribution was to create string field theory, an equation one inch long that would summarize all of string theory. That's my equation. That is uh, a great story. You mentioned music. Do you, by any chance, either play an instrument or you have any, is there a musical side of, of, of you that, it's, uh, that is connected to your scientific side? Well, um, yes, I play the trumpet. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, four years in the Harvard band, marching band, marching to every single football game okay. for four years. <laughs> But music as a metaphor allows you to, to touch the theory. Sometimes theories are so abstract, they don't mean anything to anybody. I like to bring it down to earth and show that these theories are touchable, that they're just not fancy names, that they are concepts. Let me tell you a quick story. Richard Feynman was a great physicist who, as a child, his father would explain to him all the nature of birds, the coloration, the beak, how they flap their wings, everything about birds he was an expert on. One day, a bully comes up to the young Feynman and says, hey, Dick, what's the name of that bird over there? Well, the young future Nobel laureate knew everything about that bird except its name. So he said, I don't know. And then the bully said, what's the matter, Dick? You stupid or something? And in that instant, Feynman got it. Most people think that science is giving names to birds. That's not science at all. <laughs> science is about principles, concepts, the fundamentals of why birds are the way they are, evolution and the survival of the fittest and all that. That's what science is all about. And so when I try to convey the enthusiasm that I have to science, I don't simply give names to these concepts. I give analogies. I give you metaphors. I give you historical context so that you can touch. Touch these theories. And so when we talk about string theory, it's all pure mathematics. 
People look at books on string theory and they say, oh my God, it's all mathematics. Yes, but it's the mathematics of music and you can touch these things. And that's why when I write books about science, I always keep in my mind that I have to have concepts that people can touch, that people can visualize concepts, principles, not just names. Well, that's a great segment to a question that I wanted to ask you, your last book, The God Equation, right? Uh, somebody picks that up in a bookstore, doesn't know your history, might think that they're reading a religious book, right? And then they go into science. Can you tell us a little bit about the main proposition in the book and, and what drove you to write it? Well, when people think of physics and science, they think of lots of branches and different kinds of unrelated things. But see, they're all related. First of all, all of biology and chemistry can be reduced to physics. Physics, in turn, can be reduced to relativity and the quantum theory. And then you want to reduce those two theories to an even simpler theory, the theory of everything. The theory that gives you physics, chemistry, biology, geology, astronomy as byproducts. And that equation should be one inch long. And that's where string theory comes in. The music of strings, we think, is the paradigm by which we can then summarize this vast treasure trove of knowledge that we've accumulated over 2,000 years, all these thousands of random facts, all put together in this gigantic tree, and the root of the tree, we think, is string theory. Now, we can't test it yet. We would have to build yet another particle accelerator to test the theory, but right now it is the leading and only candidate, only candidate, for a theory of everything. It has no rival. That's wonderful. Should we be seeing a, a Nobel Prize for this kind of work at any, any time soon or? Not any time soon. The mathematics is horrendous and we have to build a yet another machine. To be able to test it. So yeah. Hey, let me ask you one other thing uh, our audience may or may not know is that, I mean, last count you have over 4 million followers on Facebook, uh, a million plus uh, followers on, on Twitter. And I mean, that's an incredible social media presence. I mean, some people have called it sort of a rock star of science. And as I was thinking about that, I said, my God, does that put on you like this great responsibility that you, that you feel that whatever you tweet or you post something, you have to be totally brilliant because you have so many people following you and, and listening to your words and to your work. I mean, I wonder how, how does that shape uh, your, your daily routine, your thinking, your research? Well, I like to take a look at it this way. When you look at science as a historical process and then our role in that process, I like to think of the smallest unit of history being the decade. Now, when you take a look at all the disasters and twists and turns of politics, you look at things month by month, year by year. I don't. I look at it decade by decade. And then you see the progress the enormous progress. You realize just within the last five centuries, that tremendous middle class grew out of China and India. We've never seen a middle class of that size arise. And so we begin to realize that decade by decade, there's been an arrow, a trend towards science. And I like to be part of that trend. You realize that that trend is toward democratization because science has a direction. Now, this is controversial. Some people disagree with me. They say that science is neutral, totally neutral, not good or bad, it just is. That's science. I say no. I say science has a moral direction, that it gives you empowerment, that people who did not have access to information can get it off the web. And empowerment leads to democracy. It means that groups can then fight for their point of view to be heard rather than to be trounced upon by the powers that be. And so I like to think of myself as part of that historic process, the process of empowering people. And how do you do that? By giving them knowledge, knowledge of science, technology, and of course, knowledge of politics, because then they begin to realize that they don't have to, to, to suffer under dictatorships. They don't have to suffer under these oppressive regimes. They can take power into their own hands. And so I like to think that scientists can be part of that that science can be liberating because it empowers people to democratically decide their future for themselves. And a great setting for that uh, has to be the classroom and the work that you've done uh, at City College and at the Graduate Center. Can you give us a little bit of a sense of, of your work as a teacher, right? Does it, has it influenced your capacity to 
be a better communicator in, in terms of a wider audience? Uh, are you particularly interested in that dimension which you just talked about, about the empowering of the students to be able to become uh, politically and knowledgeable about, you know, civics and all of that? Can you talk a little bit about, you know, Professor Kaku, the, the professor, the teacher? Well, when I teach uh, these physics courses, astronomy courses, I get feedback and I begin to realize, oh my God, these kids don't know these concepts. They don't know this principle. Principles that I think are just part and parcel of science, they don't know. And so it pulls me back to reality. <laughs> I can have all these dreams that my students will become great scientists, but the reality is our educational system is not very good, especially when it comes to sciences. Mm -hmm. In fact, our educational system ranks dead last compared to other advanced industrial countries' educational system. Every test shows that our kids are just dead last. Now, it doesn't have to be that way, but I have to say to myself, I have to recalibrate the level of my kids, and then I begin to realize that when I talk to them, and I talk to them in concepts, principles, not just memorizations of facts they're gonna forget anyway, then they come alive. All of a sudden they say, I understand, I know, when I give a lecture or a talk to somebody, I like to think that there's a takeaway factor, that they're gonna walk away saying, I learned something. I see the universe in a different way now. I learned something new. So I like to impart that feeling that people say to themselves, it's just not laughs, it's just not uh, chuckles that I, uh, that I had during this lecture. I learned something. I learned a principle. And that principle will stay with you for the rest of your life. For example, when I was a kid, I used to wonder about the weather. And then one day I saw the TV screen, and the guy said, well, here's a warm front, and here's a cold front, and where they meet, that's where it rains. And I said to myself, oh my God, that's right, that's a principle. And so every time I see the weather report, it's just not random facts. I see cold fronts, hot fronts, and where they collide, there's rain. These principles stay with you for the rest of your life. And they change the way you view the world. And I like to think of myself as imparting these things to my students. And we were talking about, uh, you know, before we started the show, about the class that you're teaching now, which is uh, the physics of, uh, of fiction, right? Science and fiction. Science fiction, right? Can you talk a little bit about that class that you're teaching and, and what the lucky students that uh, have you at City College are learning? Well, let's be blunt about this. When kids learn physics for the first time, we teach, we teach them Newtonian physics, which is 300 years old. We teach them about cannonballs and by friction and tuning forks, which is great 300 years ago. But we live in a world where you go to the doctor's office, there's MRI machines, all these d different devices inside the office. You talk about the space program, you talk about the internet. None of it, none of it is taught to an elementary science course at a university. And what a loss. It means that kids take all these science courses and still can't use the internet very well, still don't understand the basics of MRI machines and the basics of, of digital computers. And that's where my course comes in, because we talk about the future. We talk about what you see in science fiction. And people say, I've heard that word. I know that concept. And you build on that. And that's why teaching the physics of science fiction is fun. And then I could teach them about warp drive, the multiverse, all the stuff they see in Marvel comics and the movies. I deconstruct it from a physics point of view, and it's a lot of fun. I'm sure that they're very lucky to have you, and you're connecting you know, your, all those concepts to things that are very familiar to them and their setting. So let's take a break. Thank you, uh, Professor Kaku, for bringing your brilliant scientific mind and love of outer space right here into CUNY TV, to our studios and for sharing a cup of coffee with us. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll be taking questions from some students from the City College of New York. Welcome back. You are watching Café Con Felo, and today my guest is Professor Kaku, a theoretical physicist and futurist who teaches at the City College of New York and at the CUNY Graduate Center. Now it is time for our students from City College to ask our guests some questions. We went back to the professor's own campus, the City College of New York, for these questions. And here is our first question from Charandant Singh. There has been a lot of improvement in quantum information science and quantum computing in the past two or three years. 
Do you think that can be applied to string theory and can be used to simulate strings in a way? I think the answer is definitely positively yes. You see, right now, digital computers are gradually exhausting their capabilities. Uh, there's something called Moore's Law. Computer power doubles every 18 months. We're used to Christmas time, computers being twice as powerful as last Christmas, but that law is slowing down now. Christmas presents are not going to be as more powerful than they were the previous Christmas. We have to go to a new type of computer called quantum computers. Computers that compute not on transistors, but atoms. This is the ultimate computer computing on atoms. In fact, that's the subject of my next book. My next book is called Quantum Supremacy, about quantum computers. And we'll think of digital computers today like an abacus, old-fashioned, ancient. So the digital computer of today, our kids and grandkids will say, what, Grandpa, you use that, that primitive device called the digital computer? They'll use quantum computers. And yes, quantum computers may be powerful enough to tease apart some of the mysteries of string theory because we know how to put a string in a computer, but these are super strings, much more mathematically developed. And yeah, ultimately it may take a computer to solve string theory. And for more of that, we should wait until you finish your book and then they can read all about it there. So what a great question and great thank you. We look forward to having you back on the show, maybe talk about that. My that next book. book. Yep. The second question comes from Marlene McKinney. What are ways in which CCNY students could get involved in string theory developments or research? Well, to get involved in string theory directly, that is to get your hands dirty with the mathematics, requires a PhD in physics, two years of postdoctorate work, and it requires four years of tensor calculus, Lie group theory. In other words, you have to be a professor to work on the theory. But the idea is simple, gorgeous. It's such a tantalizing, harmonious principle. Vibrating strings, what could be more simple than a one-dimensional string? And that's where you can then use that to understand the universe and perhaps even understand cultural references to this thing. It, string theory is in the movies now. You saw the movie Interstellar with uh, Matthew McConaughey. At the end of the movie, what does it end in? He winds up in hyperspace in a string. It, the movie ends on string theory. If you're a Star Trek fan, there's something called cosmic ribbons. Cosmic yeah. ribbons are, of course, cosmic strings, but they use that nomenclature in Star Trek. So even though you cannot actually participate in the creation of new string theory, you can appreciate it, you can talk about it, about the simplicity of the universe, how harmonious it is. It's not just random gibberish put together, but there's a, a rhyme or reason to all of this. Then you can appreciate it, write about it, appreciate the movies, and perhaps incorporate it into the way you view the universe. And I'm sure some of those references that you mentioned about Interstellar and Star Trek are also things that you teach in your class uh, about sort of physics and science fiction. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, as a Trekkie, I'm excited about those things. Mm -hmm. We have two more questions. The third one is from Anas Abu Sarham. You've always spoken of your looking up to Albert Einstein and his incredible ability of geometric thinking. As a scientist and educator yourself, what skill or feature would you like to pass on to the next generation of curious thinkers? Well, I think the most important aspect of becoming a scientist is to nurture that sense of wonderment, wonderment and curiosity. Without that, there's no fire. Without that, there's no initiative. There's nothing driving you. You have to have that sense of wonderment. And then that sense of curiosity, that after you get over that wonderment, you begin to say, well, gee, how did it happen anyway? Maybe I can contribute to this thing. And then you begin to realize that you too can propose principles and concepts that'll push science forward. Because science is not about giving names to things. People think that that's what science is all about. In fact, there's a famous play by a French writer, Moliere, called the, the Doctor in Spite of Himself, where this peasant learns to use gibberish to mask himself and act like a great scientist. And so here was this total idiot using these this fancy French words to pass himself off when he was actually an ignorant peasant. 
So words don't make the scientist. It's the principles, the concepts that make science, and that's what anyone can engage in. So again, the sense of wonderment, the sense of curiosity, and then of course you have to pay your dues. You have to get your hands dirty and learn how it actually works. And our last question comes from a colleague, James Hedberg, the director of the CCNY Planetarium. It seems like it's getting harder and harder to interact with nature like we did when we were kids. It's hard to fix a radio, you can't even take apart a car, you can't even see the stars in the sky anymore. What can we do in the future to make sure we don't lose these great connections with the natural world? Well, it's true. Uh, when I was a kid uh, and the TV broke, broke uh, we used to take the tubes out and go to the supermarket and test each tube. You can't do that anymore. Everything is transistorized. But you realize now that on your cell phone, you can put the entire night sky with all the constellations. Now, think about it. When you go to the night sky and look up, it's gibberish. You don't know where the Big Dipper is, where Orion is, because it's a cloudy day or whatever. On your cell phone now, you simply point north, push a button, and there are the constellations. And so, yes, it's true that we lose something by having satellites, by having lights, by having computers that are more powerful than anything we can construct. But on your cell phone now, you can recreate the entire night sky. You can download the Encyclopedia Britannica on your cell phone. And so, yes, we've lost a certain amount of wonderment. We don't touch test tubes anymore, but we've gained something more. And that is the, the fountain of knowledge of the entire universe in your cell phone. And for our younger viewers, you can go and Google what the Encyclopedia Britannica is and what those tubes are, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, and that's all the time that we have. Unfortunately, Professor Kako, it's been a pleasure sitting down with you here, and we wish you the very best in all your future scientific endeavors, in finishing the, the book that you talked about, and all your also your activism and the work that you do. Uh, thank you so much, and live long and prosper, like they say in Star Trek. And thank you for watching, and please tune in for Café Con Felo on weekends. That's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. on CUNY TV. Saludos.